I'm going to jump right into this. No special introduction. Here it goes. So, what's the only difference between the Hidden Colors presentation and a Christian's presentation on the subject of Nicaea, Christ, and Egyptian religion? Sources, sources, and yes, more sources. Please listen up. It's their sources and their spin that they put on their sources that are the very source of their own non-sequitur claims on the subject of Jesus, Nicaea, and religion. What does non-sequitur mean? I'll give you an example of what non-sequitur means. It means that your conclusions that you draw do not match your data. In other words, I could say the reason why the sky is green is because the sky is really blue. That makes no sense. It means that, once again, that your conclusions that you draw do not match anything that you presented before it. All the data, whatever evidence you presented, it doesn't match your conclusion. That's what a non sequitur is, and that's exactly what I've been trying to stress from the hidden colors have been doing. How so? How do we know what we know? Let's take a look. Now, I put this together so you could easily see where we're coming from. On the left side, you have hidden color sources. Um, these are sources that I've read. I have not read all of them, but I continue to study them, you know, day by day. And all the sources are not on the left. There are a lot more Egyptian sources that um, that have been uh, written. Um, of course, I did not want to put them all on the PowerPoint slide because then it would just take up all the space but that should be enough for right now they're called primary texts it's what people wrote it's what they believed and you have underneath that what I what I call demonstrations how their belief was understood so you have the text saying one thing and then you have people who read those texts or who were around those people that begin to speak about what they believe if you look on the left once again you only have Herodotus, Diodorus, Plutarch, Hippocrates. Um, these are people who basically spoke about uh, what they saw in Egypt, uh, the Egyptians, and what their beliefs are. Only problem is that the Hidden Colors people really don't like the fact that, well, a lot of the people that spoke about Egyptian beliefs and Egyptians themselves were Greeks. But then again, they really shouldn't have a problem with it because, you know, in Hidden Colors 2, uh, they did say that the Greeks were their cousins, which I definitely do agree. I mean, they were the same people, basically, for a long period of time. I mean, the Greeks were Africans anyway, but I, I'm getting carried away. So that's basically how we end up knowing if something is really true in history to the best of our ability. It either comes from the text that they read, you know, you could read from the primary text, or B, if it's really not there, but it's kind of there, but it's kind of not, then... Somebody from history should be able to say, oh, this is what these people believed. On the right, it's the same thing. We have the New Testament and we have the Old Testament Septuagint. Those are our sources to show, hey, this is what we believe. Underneath there, we have what? Demonstrations, which are early Christian writings, non-Christian secular accounts, you know, people who were not Christians who were speaking about Christianity and what they believed. And the same thing goes for Jews. They do the same thing. So we could go, hey, our text says this. And the people who end up saying uh, certain things about our beliefs end up saying the same thing that we do. That's how you actually do history in terms of texts. So the problem is, since they don't have anyone that speaks about how they believe what they believe, they put themselves in. That's the problem. The problem is they weren't around in 400 BC. They weren't around in 2000 BC to be saying what they're saying. That's the issue. If you're going to read from the coffin text, the Shaboko stone, if you're going to read from all these things, but yet what you conclude isn't found in your texts, or any, anything near it, then why should we believe you? That's called spreading lies, especially to young people who are African Americans who want to know the truth about what they believe. So let me break this down even better. Hidden Colors claims. 
16 crucified saviors before Jesus. That's what Anthony Browder said. Jesus was copied from Horus. Apollonius was used to make Jesus. Arius said Jesus was plagiarized. Arius never went to Nicaea. Horus and Jesus were born on December 25th. Jesus was just a man, and his deity came from myths, and Nicaea was used by Constantine to control people through religion and military. That's their claims. What's the problem? It's not found in actual history. It's not found in actual primary text. And what's worse is that there's nobody around during those times that were speaking how they are speaking. There's no one around there uh, speaking any of their claims. You know, I even put Arius down there because they have their own spin on Arius. Arius has his own works. We can read from them. For some odd reason, they don't. They like to make their own spin on things. And then when you try to actually find people who are speaking like they do in history, you can't find these people. You can't find any writings at all. You can't find any, any demonstrations of their claims in history. That is the problem. But yet, I go on the other side of Christianity and I find that we do have people that say what we say. I can point to something. They can't. That's the bottom line. Their claims can't be found in sources. That means primary texts or demonstrations. I could go on to Anthony Browder. He, his take on Constantine, for example. He said that Nicaea was used by Constantine to control people through religion. Let's take a look at the clip, and then after that, I'm going to show you something else. The House of Nicaea uh, was an effort by, by Constantine to control the people through military and through religion. One, he entered without his normal entourage of soldiers and guards, instead accompanied only by friends in the faith. This is an indication that his entrance was the very opposite of a show of force, so much for him strong-arming the bishops in his submission. Whoever can control your concept of God has a weapon more powerful than, than, than any physical weapon, than any sword, any, any gun, any atomic weapon. Whoever controls how you relate to the unseen presence of God will not only control you, but can control your children and your children's children. So it was at the Council of Nicaea that the Constantine, this emperor, needed to find a way to consolidate his power because the people that he conquered in various parts of the world had different religions, different, different ideologies. If you look here, now what we have is primary text. Unlike him, I could actually point back to something and back up my claim. My claim is, is that Constantine really didn't care about controlling Christianity. He wanted to legalize all religions, not only just Christianity. How can I know this? Well, in 313 AD, we have a copy of of the Edict of Milan and it was written in February and this is a letter written by Constantine basically saying that you know all religions can be practiced in Rome and uh, you know the West or Constantinople Byzantine Empire what all religions under the Roman Empire can be practiced including Christianity this is what this letter is saying now does that sound like someone who's trying to control religion through military? Does it sound like it? No. Then where are they getting their conclusions from? That's the point that I've been trying to say this entire time. So, next up, Booker T. Coleman's take on Arius. He said that Arius never showed up at the council, but instead fled to the north for fear of assassination. Before fleeing the north, he sent a letter to Constantine explaining that Jesus was just a ripoff of Horus in Egypt. Now, once again, there's one problem. We have Arius' writings. Why didn't he actually show that Arius believed this? Why? Well, maybe because if you read Arius' writings, you'll find that he actually believed in Jesus. As I've stated before, I've read every single document to and from Arius and not a single one makes any mention at all of Serapis. Arius 
Arius didn't think that Jesus was a ripoff of Serapis. He argued against the Trinity. Show me a single primary source anywhere that supports your ridiculous claims. Arius was a Christian presbyter, and he sought his whole life to be made a bishop in the church. In 327 AD, Arius wrote, quote, We believe the word through whom all things were made, both things in heaven and on earth, who descended and became a man, and suffered and rose again, ascended into heaven, and will come again to judge the living and the dead, end quote. In his poem Thalia, written before Nicaea, Arius describes his view of the relationship between the Father and the Son, Jesus. Quote, He who is without beginning made the Son a beginning of created things. He produced him as a Son for himself by begetting him. He is invisible both to things which are made through the Son and also to the Son himself. The Son can bear to see the Father as is determined. So there is a triad, non equal glories, however. End quote. So you couldn't be more wrong here. Arius believed in the historical man Jesus and put his faith in Jesus. What he argued wasn't that Jesus never existed. He argued that Jesus wasn't equal with the Father. This is the primary reason why Nicaea was held in the first place. Because he's saying, how are you going to tell people this? That Nobody's going to believe that story. That, that immaculate conception, come on, you know, that's written on the walls of Egypt. That's a mythology, that's an analogy. You're not supposed to believe that story. That's a nice story to live by, that each and every one of us has Jesus within us and every birth is an immaculate conception. But there was no one boy born as the son of God to free, come on, you, 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 you can't. In 325, it was decided that Jesus Christ would be born in the manger in Bethlehem. Up until the Nicene Council, most people believed that Jesus Christ was born in a cave in Ethiopia, even in Ethiopia till today. Show me in any of the 5,600 early New Testament manuscripts where Jesus is described as having been born in Ethiopia. You have to qualify your outrageous claims with evidence. And also, we have a tremendous amount of manuscripts for the New Testament that long predate Nicaea. You made a big deal about Christianity existing in Africa long before the Roman world. I completely agree with this position, as I have indicated in my article and argued in my documentary. Now, in saying this, if you were trying to argue that Christianity was birthed out of Africa, not Palestine, then I challenge you to provide me with a single ancient source that makes such a claim. Because I can provide dozens of non-Christian early sources that all state that Christianity started in Palestine at the instigation of the historical Jew Yeshua. For example, the Jewish historian Josephus, who lived contemporaneously with Jesus, wrote, quote, Now there was about this time Jesus. He was a doer of paradoxical deeds. He drew over to him many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. When Pilate, at the suggestion of principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at first did not forsake him. And the tribe of Christians, so named after him, are not extinct to this day." End quote. Tacitus in the first century is considered to be perhaps one of the greatest Roman historians, and was well known for constantly giving disclaimers and critical explications when he was unable to thoroughly verify what he was documenting in his histories. In his description of Jesus, his regular disclaimer is never given. Therefore, we can conclude it is reliable. He states, quote, Christus, the founder of the Christian name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition, repressed for a time, broke out again, not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome as well, end quote. Celsus, who tried to refute Christianity, wrote in the second century, quote, Jesus had come from a village in Judea and was the son of a poor Jewess, end quote. Now these are just three quick non-Christian primary sources. If you are claiming that Christianity started out in Egypt, you must provide me with counter sources. You claim that statues with the baby horse were remade by the late Roman Catholic Church hundreds of years later in the images of the Madonna and Child. As I stated in my article, I completely agree with this position and I argue for it when I converse with Catholics. As your own source indicates, this has nothing to do with early Christianity. It has to do with the Roman Catholic Church. Finally, in conclusion, I was terribly unimpressed with what you put forward. You claim that Constantine changed the biblical text. Anyone who knows anything about textual criticism will tell you that this is laughable. The Christian texts were much too widely disseminated to have been changed by anyone. You have to realize it was the Roman emperors themselves who tried to destroy Christianity and the Christian texts for the first 300 years. Everybody.